Hey, and welcome back to the number one podcast in the world, the Cellarcast, episode 84. Uh, some people ask me sometimes, hey, why is it called Cellarcast and not the Cellarcast? When I'll call it the Cellarcast, but it's not the Cellarcast, it's just Cellarcast in the official title and branding and, and all that. Uh, and the answer is that when I was writing down the channel name, when I was making the channel, I decided I, I wrote it down as Cellarcast. Uh, it, it's kind of like how, you know, it's, 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 we say like the United States of America, but the name of the country isn't like capital the United States of America. It's just the United States of America, right? Like that's, that's how it. That's, that's how we treat... Like, no one ever questions that, but for some reason, I'll just be playing a game in the middle of it, like, get a call from a bunch of my friends just asking me, like, hey, Tiger, why is it called Cellarcast and not the Cellarcast? People... So many people have asked me about that. It, it's... It's really funny. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the backstory. It just... It feels right. It feels right to me to, to for it to be Cellarcast. But I'll call it the Cellarcast... You know, it, it make, it make, if, you, if you were in my head, which, which I hope you would never be, uh, it would make a lot of sense. Anyway, um, I feel like I'm always like tempted, like, oh, should I start off talking about my week? And then I remember, oh, no, I, we did, I did kind of do something this week. Uh, <laughs> I guess, um, besides my usual, I, uh, I, it was Kat's birthday. It was Kat's birthday last week, and so I went over to her house, and she's currently going through an Ardman animation phase. <laughs> Excuse me. She's going through an Ardman animation phase, who, if you guys don't know, uh, is the, the claymation studio, the British claymation studio that did uh, Wallace and Gromit and Shaun the Sheep and apparently a bunch of other stuff uh, for, like, random studios and... Oh, they did Chicken Run. Yeah, they did Chicken Run. They're, they're those guys. Uh, apparently coined the term claymation. Did not know that. Uh, so she, she's going through a big Ardman phase right now. Uh, she got a plush of a little sheep. Like the little baby sheep from Shaun the Sheep. I think his name is Timmy. She got one of those. Um, she had like... It was random. We went into the thrift store we always go by, and just randomly sitting on the shelf there was like a DVD for like Shaun the Sheep. Like, oh my God, you manifested that! So uh, we went home, and she had. <laughs> so she had us watch um, the original. I realize I've never actually seen uh, the Wallace and Gromit shorts. There's only three of them, I believe. I've never actually seen them before. I've seen a little bit of the movie Curse of the Were Rabbit, uh, but the uh, the shorts, no, I, I I thought I had, but it turns out I hadn't. Um, so we we watched those first, and uh, they're great. I really enjoyed them. They're like really funny. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the animation, I love watching it. Um, I I found myself. It, it, constantly thinking about how difficult it must have been to do like there's a shot where uh they in in the first short where they go to the moon to find to find cheese uh there's a shot where they light um they light like the fuse for the sh for the rocket ship and the fuse like light, it like burns the fuse burns there's a shot of it burning and it's like real uh, real rope and everything and I was just thinking, like, how did they film that? Like, did they actually just light a fuse and then let it burn and then just take a bunch of photos of it? Um, cause, like, cause, like, it's actually, they didn't cut it. It's clearly, like, the end is, like, burning, right? Um, just, like, lots of little, little things like that. Like, how, man, how? There's this scene in the same short of, like, Wallace, uh, writing down like drawing this diagram on like a piece of paper and i'm just thinking like god how annoying was this to like fit? like they would have to draw every individual stroke 
of the pencil and like like on the paper they would have to actually draw it and then make him then then animate him following uh following the path of like where it's, it's supposed to be drawing and it, it's so crazy um but it's great it, it hits that nice spot where it's like sometimes some you know like you watch something and you find yourself just like seeing how do i describe this you ever see a movie with like bad cg and you just think about like you can just it just completely takes you out of it this hits kind of that sweet spot where i'm watching it and i'm enjoying it i'm still into it but i'm thinking about how it was made like there's like a an appreciation for like the craftsmanship i guess um i'm it's it, it, it it's it's technically taking me out of the movie but it, it's like making me more invested in a weird way whereas like you see bad cg and you're like Oh, now I'm just I'm just thinking about how bad the, I'm just thinking about like I'm not watching the movie anymore. I'm thinking about the process that this was made by, <laughs> like completely. Um, yeah, Wallace and Gromit is a uh, it's great. It's it's super charming. It's genuinely funny. It's quite funny. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, just just really like pleasant, great shorts. I I uh, they're great. And then uh. And then we watched this DVD. We had. apparently there's like a billion episodes of Shaun the Sheep. Uh, the one we watched only had eight. Um, uh, also, really cute. <laughs> uh, one thing that I was actually that I I I, uh, I forget because Cap mentioned to me that apparently in like Japan they love Ardman. They love Ardman animations. And I was watching Shaun the Sheep, and I was thinking about this because I was like, "Oh yeah, I've seen a little bit of of Shaun the Sheep. I think, a, a li- like one, maybe a couple shorts, right? Like when I was a kid." But I was watching it now, and I was I was thinking, "Oh yeah, you know, there's no dialogue. There's no dialogue in in this entire uh this entire series. Uh, it's all just kind of like it's all just visual gags and and movements and facial expressions and." the when people speak it, it's just they just make little sounds right it, they make like star fox sounds like that um which is like i guess the sheep's perspective of what they're supposed to sound like <laughs> um i uh, uh, i was thinking yeah actually that probably i had this revelation i was like that's probably why one of the reasons why why uh these shorts are like apparently really popular internationally because you, you don't need any there's no language barrier there might be like you know some writing in english or something like that but uh, you can pretty much tell what everything is um uh, uh just just based off of the visuals and how it's how it's yeah how it's communicated that way how it's presented um and i realized i'm like that's probably why oh my god like that's why uh we were talking we we ended up that we had like a, a short tiny little <laughs> back and forth about this it's probably why like all these little uh uh like the minions the rabbits the little you know little like all these little like doobie doobie and doobie properties i don't know what you like, little doobie goober uh properties of, of just like little characters who just kind of make noises and they're very like accessible and like round and they don't really speak in anything and it's probably why they're also that also gets like super popular. I always think of stuff in terms of like I guess the English speaking market. But I think about it, I'm like, there's probably a huge market for this stuff over like internationally as well. And a lot of that probably has to do with the fact that you can like understand stuff just just purely based on um on visuals. <laughs> Excuse me. It's not something that I'm very familiar with. Uh that sort of experience because because I was trying to think of like stuff that was in the reverse like uh, international stuff uh, like non English st- uh, countries making stuff that that was understandable to me without any dialogue and all that um, and I couldn't really think of, of much and I think that that's kind of like a weird little perspective issue that comes from uh, being in an English speaking country and just growing up and having uh, almost all stuff internationally cater in some way to that. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, 
yeah I just, it it it's yeah i don't know like everything either that or everything gets like translated into english so yeah i i i <laughs> sort of unrelated but like one of the funny things about america is that uh this country is like you can get by if you if you're in certain communities and you speak certain languages like there's areas where uh like where i grew up in chicago called uh, rogers park it's a neighborhood called rogers park and you could probably get by only knowing spanish in rogers park there's enough like mexicans there and like mexican businesses and people like people who are like you know bilingual you can probably get by around there knowing mostly Spanish. If you go outside there to maybe some of the other communities, especially especially if you've got to go downtown or or anywhere else other than that, you uh, you might have to. You, you're probably gonna have to know some some more English, uh, where it gets you know a little more diverse. Uh, but like yeah, there's there's certain communities where you can kind of get by not knowing English, but overall. Like, <laughs> there's so many stay-at-home Mexican moms in Rogers Park who just who literally don't know any English. Like, they barely speak English because uh, they just stay at home and they just watch like Spanish television all day, uh, and and uh, t- and hang out with their Spanish friends and they speak Spanish at home and they never really learn English and it's it's I don't know it's kind of odd, um, it's kind of funny I guess, uh, uh, the um. But America as a whole is really optimized for English. Like, like, <laughs> they're, like, everything, even if you are in an area that's very, like, heavily, um, like, has a, has a specific language that they speak, uh, usually going to be Spanish, right? Um, there, there's all, every sign is going to have, like, it was actually, it was very normal for me to grow up with, uh, Spanish and English text right next to each other. And even here in California... Uh, we have big Asian population. We have a big, um, also big like Hispanic population. So you see, you'll usually see it'll usually be like uh, English, Spanish, and Chinese. Sometimes they'll they'll throw they'll have like uh, Japanese, Vietnamese, Korean. But those it's usually like English, Spanish, Chinese. What I what I can tell, uh, at least like just taking the bus and you know stuff like that. Like all the signs have those. Those are like the three ones that they really want to hit. Um. But uh, yeah, if you can speak English, you can go anywhere. I'm very spoiled like that because I never, I never had, the, I've never been forced to learn another language <laughs> to communicate or you know understand the world. That's uh, so why I, I feel like living in another, living in another country for a while would be kind of interesting. Just you know to put force me to adapt. <laughs> oh, I would be, I would be so embarrassed if I lived in like I don't know another country. If I lived in uh, Germany for like a year and i still had to like uh, um do, how do you even say how do you even say like let's look up the deep l uh how do you even say like i don't know i don't know uh i don't speak german Ich, ich spreche kein Deutsch. <laughs> ich spreche kein Deutsch. <laughs> I would feel embarrassed uh, uh, still like living for a year and not being able to speak any of the language. That would freak me the fuck out. I'd feel bad about that. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I would feel bad about it, like, one, because it's, like, ah, I feel, like, personally, but also, it's, like, I've had this experience on the other end. I, it's probably really easy to sound racist saying this. I've had this experience on the other end, but, like, when you're trying to communicate with someone who doesn't speak your language, it's really hard, obviously, right? Or they only, like, speak really, really limited of your language. It's really difficult, um, and I would personally feel bad if I had to like go to the store and communicate with someone who was trying to help me and I just didn't, and I, or I was trying to ask for help from someone. Cause I've been in the opposite position where I don't think badly of someone who can't speak, you know, my, can't speak English or something, but it's like, oh fuck, I'm feeling really pressured right now. <laughs> oh fuck. 
uh, 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 <laughs> feeling really pressured because I can't, like, communicate with you properly. <laughs> I don't want to put someone in that position myself. Like, that would make me feel bad, um, personally. I don't know. Uh, how do I start talking about this? Right, I don't know. We watched that, and then it's on the sheep. It's cute. It, it's really good. It, it's, it's genuinely pretty funny, and, um... Uh, uh, what else? Oh, and then we, then later later that evening we watched Curse of the Were Rabbit. I got like I had a whole I had a day of of Ardman, and uh, Curse of the Were Rabbit also pretty funny. Uh, also enjoyed it quite a bit. It's got all that weird weird British <laughs> British humor and just kind of odd. I don't know. It's it's a little off off kilter in like a fun kind of charming cute way. Lots of little like vis- great visual gags and uh, yeah, it, it's great. I would yeah, they're great. Check if, if you have it. I, I I they're they're great. You can watch the. I can enjoy it as a, as a fresh faced twenty one year old. Uh, also also like probably really fun to watch with your family. <laughs> um. Uh, the, yeah, it's it's like it's again in like one of those one of those nice. Uh, Another sort of sweets is it can, it can kind of be enjoyed by people of all all sorts of ages. Uh, it it's just Jan. Was there like any kind of? There might have been like one sort of very, uh, off to the side like adult reference or something, but really difficult to like like in the the movie or something like that, but not like, uh. uh yeah, not not a, not a lot. Like yeah, uh, it d- didn't rely on that. I guess I feel a little like eh. Okay, like when you have to rely on like innuendo and stuff in a kids thing to make the adults enjoy it. Cause uh, I don't know. I uh, one of my one of my favorite. I just I just remember this. I just just reminded of of uh, of Chowder. I I love Chowder. The well the the the, the dish and the and the cartoon. Um, and I remember like. One thing that I really loved about Chowder, or that that kind of makes it special to me, is that was like one of the few cartoons that like my dad actually really liked watching with me, because uh, he found it really funny. And I went back and I watched a couple of the episodes, um, somewhat recently, and they're probably funnier to me now as an adult, like <laughs> than as than as a kid, like uh, uh, just little like quips and lines and just kind of weird absurdist humor. All the weird experimental stuff. I saw a clip the other day of, um, it's that, that episode that's great. If you've never seen Chowder, uh, there's like this episode where, I forget what the setup is, but basically they run out of money. They run out of money in the show and, and, uh, Mung Dahl says something like, you know what this means? We, no money means no animation and they cut to like the voice actors in the booth which is I, I like that they uh uh they they all recorded like next to each other a lot of, a lot of animated series like they everyone records their lines like at separate sessions i like that they actually uh would record everything in like a, the same booth pretty much that's I, I i i always appreciate that invader zim also did that um and so, like, it's all, it's the actual voice actors, <laughs> and, uh, they have to come up with, like, a way to, uh, like, get money back, so they decide to do a car wash, and they just go to, like, the Cartoon Network, like, a parking garage, and they just wash, like, I'm assuming some intern's car or something like that. <laughs> and then, they, until they make enough money back to, to, to get their animation again. <laughs> And it's just like this weird, like you never, you would never see anyone do that. Apparently, I found out they got in a, a bunch of trouble with like their their union because, uh, um, uh, like on camera live action stuff. There's like different rules for that in SAG, and uh, the <laughs> they like didn't follow or something. Because it probably took them, like, you know, a few, like, an hour or two to, like, do or something. It was, they were just like, fuck it. It was just probably, like, a fun idea that they had. <laughs> and uh, they didn't, they didn't, well, well, we have to pay the specific dues and things for this. Um, uh, uh, yeah, that, what a great, fun, fun show. I was another, oh, there's, like, a whole, se- there's an episode where Chowder, like, 
goes to the he like gets sent up to the stars or something and there's like a puppet in the sky and it's ch greenblatt the creator of the show and he just talks to chowder <laughs> and it's like this funny little like really uh really i don't know what you'd call it, like really funny like puppet version of him uh it, what a funny it's just funny weird show I love this. There's this one line I remember of, uh, there's some episode where Truffles gets mad at Mung Doll and Chowder doesn't know what's wrong. And he asks Mung Doll why she's upset at him. And he goes, well, Chowder, women have these things in their bodies called expectations. <laughs> oh, it's such a good, it's such a good, <laughs> that's just great. Um, uh yeah what is that guy we're 20 minutes on i haven't yet there's a bunch of stuff i wanted to talk about uh i guess i'll jump in with the first thing uh side note so we had we had no comments by the way but we had no questions last episode so we're just gonna we're gonna we're gonna dive right in um i had the unfortunate privilege of watching uh the street fighter 6 snl sketch <laughs> last night um not on television but just i, I just watched it on youtube because i saw a clip of it i'm like oh god i saw like the first 20 seconds uh where they mispronounce ryu's name they call him ryu <laughs> um <laughs> excuse me. so yeah i guess capcom capcom has been doing like a lot of stuff like a lot of uh marketing stuff <laughs> for sf6 like they're really it, it kind of takes me back you know it takes me back a little bit because there used to be this era i want in like the seventh sixth and seventh gen with all of these like tie-ins that games would do I, I feel like like really out there tie-ins where um i'm trying to think of one and i can't remember ones because I'm a, I'm a complete sham but uh uh now, I feel like there was a point in time where video game marketing got very like, okay, it's normal now, right? Like, here's a trailer. We're going to have an event uh, that's like an industry event or like an announcement event, and we're going to show another trailer. Uh, you know, you're not really seeing like, oh, uh, at like a, oh god there's got to be some funny example there was like the ea um dante's inferno fake protesters there was stuff like that there, i don't know like reach it trying to reach out to a broader audience than gamers you know than than, than gamer because because i guess the because the gaming audience was was not nearly as big as it was now um so there was like a significant effort to like reach out and uh, to like mainstream let's say stuff um, and, and so, like, there was, like, a, the WWE Royal Rumble, and, like, one of the, uh, which I guess is, like, I'm not sure, I don't know, if, I don't follow WWE, I don't know what the Royal Rumble is exactly, but it's apparently some kind of, like, exhibition spectator fun thing, and, uh, one of the, uh, 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 wrestlers, her name was Zelina Vega, I believe? Uh, just came out as like as jury <laughs> she's just jury uh sf6 jury she looks great and uh she does a bunch of like references and poses and moves she does like jury's level three as like a finishing move to one of the other uh one of the other wrestlers uh she's wearing shoes though during as a total scam uh d d minus grade f grade fail um uh so like uh, okay it was okay that was interesting um and then, and then they also paid uh, for a tie-in to be on snl saturday night live or snell as cat calls it s-n-e-l-l -L, snell which I, I think is very funny uh the sketch i was expecting it to be way worse than it was um, in my personal in my personal opinion, as an expert uh, viewer of comedy, it's fine. Um, it's it's all right. I didn't find it particularly funny. I don't think I really laughed. I, I think I was smiling, but that was more just because it was so strange. 
Uh, one thing I wanted to point out. So the premise of the the premise of the sketch is that Michael B. Jordan and another guy who's on the cast of SNL is something with a Y, like Brian Yehan or something like that. Yoon, uh, an Asian gentleman. He's uh, they're 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 in the booth and they are doing voiceover for Street Fighter 6. They're 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 voicing Michael B Jordan is Ryu. Wait. No, no, no. Michael B Jordan is Ken and and uh other gentleman is uh is is Ryu. Uh and so it's them and like the two guys in the sound booth, right? Or or in the in the what do they call that? The 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 studio, the producer's room, the control room, whatever you call it. So the the like voice director. So there's like this really odd moment where the voice director he's like, okay, um, you are, uh, uh, you're Ryu, a martial artist seeking true strength, and you're Ken, a uh, former um, American martial arts champion. And Michael B. Jordan, who's Ken, says something along the lines of. That'll be easy. I used to serve. And in my mind, there was a moment where I was like, oh, he said, he said, surf. He, he obviously meant, he obviously said surf, right? That's the only thing that makes sense. I used to surf because Ken is a blonde guy from California and surfing, right? And then, and then it gave out and then my mind gave out and I realized, no. He said, I used to serve, as in serve in the military, as in at some point in this sketch, they wrote him to be playing Guile. And then changed it to Ken, I'm assuming at Capcom's request. Uh, and, and, and... Then, so they remembered to change the backstory, like the introduction for the character, but they forgot to change Michael B. Jordan's dialogue referring to Guile stuff and, like, mil being in the military. So it makes no sense. <laughs> it's really strange. It doesn't, like, ruin it, but it's just really odd because he makes another reference to it later on about like a guy he used to serve with in iraq and i'm like ken was not in the military <laughs> he was what and i'm i'm pretty sh hang on maybe i can hang on uh uh sf6 snl do they have in the background do they have it in the background uh in the booth uh because they have a i have to look this up now oh my god just show me the okay uh so they show like the guy oh my god i think it's <laughs> they have like three pictures in the sound booth one is guiles on the right the sf5 champion edition uh, poster in the middle and i think that's supposed to be the street fighter 5 like the original box art um of like the blue ryu with the black and white and i'm like was that was they put guile back there because it was supposed to be guile was that it was that was that what was that happened um yeah the whole sketch 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 uh, basically revolves around the joke is that they're trying to do voiceover for these characters. Bowen Yang, that's his name. Bowen Yang's the other guy. Uh, the, the, is that they're trying to do voiceover for these characters and Michael B. Jordan is doing like, like what you would expect. And then Bowen Yang is being really gay and he's really like effeminate and, and yas and ickies and i was like okay i get it it's a fine joke and then like the then like the the, the director is like 
no, it's not how you, that's not how you do it. And, and then it just kind of, it's basically what, there isn't like a big twist or anything. Um, Oh, the the twist at the end. It's not that funny. I, I don't. I, you can go watch it for yourself. It's. I didn't find it that funny. I don't think it's it's that crazy to uh <laughs> to spoil what the twist is at the end. Is the director is like no one would ever sound like that in a fight. They wouldn't be, you know, talking about you know gay sex and kissing on men and stuff like that. Bo and Yang. They wouldn't talk about like that. Uh, uh no one would be so homo. And, and a fighter. <laughs> and then uh, the, like, previous... Someone, like, who got fired that they set up at the start, he got fired because, like, the director, like, fucked his wife or something like that. Uh, comes in and he's going to try to kill him. And then Bo and Yang goes, oh, 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 I'm gay! And then he punches him and, and, and knocks him out. And he's like, damn, I guess you would sound like that in a fight and that's the that's the that's the twist it's not the worst thing in the world i just thought it was super odd um really just 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 strange it was very surreal they played ryu's theme which was cool the from sf6 i uh, i wasn't really sure about it at first man it's grown on me the jazz it's really cool sounding to me. I really like. I'm a big fan of of, of it actually. Um, yeah, it it really takes like a special. It could only come from Capcom, right? I feel like Capcom. If I if I trust any modern day video game publisher, especially Japanese ones, to do weird brand tie-ins to try and like penetrate a larger market. It would be Capcom. Nintendo, Nintendo's going to go with the safe option, right? They're going to have a little animated movie. Everyone already knows who Mario is. Um, Square, the weirdest thing Square's going to do is, like, have Sora at Disneyland. Oh, God, that was... I'm just imagining, like, being a parent who doesn't know what Kingdom Hearts is. And, like, going to Disneyland and all the regular Disney characters. And then fucking Sora from Kingdom Hearts. Who is this anime motherfucker in the Magic Kingdom? What is he doing here? Uh, uh, yeah, what a... What a we And it, I don't know, I feel weird. I'm like, damn, am I out of touch? Do I just have a really different sense of humor? Because, like, I'm looking at the comments on this, and everyone loves it. Everyone, every every one of these comments loves it. And I, I was like, huh. My favorite this season. Favorite sketch. Uh, this this had me. Finally a funny SNL. <laughs> All right. Uh, it didn't, in terms of, like, delivery and writing, it didn't really hit what I'd find funny, but... Hey, you know what are you what are you gonna do? It was a weird. It's a weird little. I'll I'll enjoy looking back on this as a weird part of history. <laughs> hey, speaking of a weird part of history, uh, good article on the uh, from a a uh, person. Let's see, what is it? What is it name? Rani Rani R A N I Baker. Uh. Uh, wrote a, an article on the video game crash of 1983. Did it? Did the video game crash of 1983 even really happen? Which is a slightly like yeah, it's 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 one of those like it's uh it's it's an attention grabbing title, right? Uh, this is a really interesting article because I was already a bit of a skeptic, I guess, of of the crash. Um, it kind of. Like, I remember growing up, and it was always... It always gets billed as this, like, legendary event. Oh, my God. The the video... Someone called it, like... the. It, someone said people basically treat it like it's the 9-11 of video games. Uh, and it's, like... The more you look into it, the more it's, like... Eh? Are you... Really? Eh? I don't know. Like... <laughs> It's very like a. It's very mythologized, I guess. Um, and 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 I've been pretty upfront with like. Whenever I bring it up, like, well, technically, yeah, it's not. 
if it was anything, it was an American console market crash. In Japan, I mean, 83 was the year uh, the Famicom was, was released, just about. Um, and, and if you look at, especially because uh, I, I think this is a thing, this is a problem I see with a lot of game discourse and like uh, gaming history kind of discussion is that there is an, an immense console bias. I guess just because they're more, they were more mainstream. But there was an immense console bias in the way that people talk about game history. So, like, being someone who's also really into, like, PC gaming history, I look at it and I'm like, I mean, games just kind of, ca- like, computer games, PC games, you know. Uh, uh, DOS, Amiga, Commodore, 64, uh, uh, Atari 8-bit. <laughs> Right, uh, Apple too. They just kind of they they kept on trucking. Like there was basically no disruption in those years for those those markets. I mean, the early eighties. Uh, you know, I, I, I'll bring up sometimes the the very underrated uh, contributions to gaming by uh, the UK. A lot of that happened on the PC in the eighties. Uh, in in the in the early '80s, I did a video forever ago about Bandersnatch. That happened in like, um, oh god, Imagine Software. When was that? In the early mid early '80s. Like no, they were, they had a booming, uh, thriving market at that time. Like, uh, very competitive, in 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 terms of like, uh, software at least. Um, and and this article kind of even goes a little further, and it sort of claims with some pretty decent evidence to back it up that the console market crash is like a little even that is like a little it's not the full picture uh so an interesting basically what happened what seems more likely or what what seems more um a more accurate reading of history is that um atari fucked up Atari exploded, basically, sort of, basically. Um, they basically take so it's like a, a in 1982, the retail sales, the retail uh, video game console market was pulling in 3.2 billion, and then the next year, or uh, uh, in 1983 or 1984, that number was 800 million. Oh my god, huge! Oh my god, the market crashed. Um, well, apparently 80% of the 3.2 billion, so about $760 million of that, uh, was just Atari. <laughs> it was just Atari. They were, they had 80% of the market. Um, and what else happened in 1984? They had a new owner. Uh, Jack Tra- Tramiel, Tramiel, I don't know how you pronounce that, uh, from Commodore, who uh, shut down cartridge development. Th- they just stopped selling cart- uh, cartridges. They started just focusing on the the, the computer, the home computer market, as opposed to the console market. Th- they just stopped. <laughs> there wasn't really. Yeah, and the, the, uh, yeah, something else I didn't realize is the the idea of the overproduced Pac-Man and an ET sales, um, overproduced, undersold. Pac-Man apparently sold really well. Pac-Man apparently sold really well. I I didn't know this. Um, and ET, uh, the window that it released in, it was literally impossible. Um. It was literally impossible for ET to have actually affected. Um, the sales, because it came out in, like, December, uh, what's the year? Christmas 1982. It came out Christmas 1982. Uh, so, like, literally impossible. (laughs) Um... And they say this is the same month as the December 7th shareholder meeting and earnings report, which first started to tank the Atari stock. It is literally impossible for ET to have affected... Wrong wrong affected. It should have been an A. 
uh, Ranny Baker, to have affected the stock price at the beginning of 1983. <laughs> it's not how stocks, business quarters, or earning assessments work. Um, so, hey, why did the stock tank? Well, it turns out that the Atari CEO at the time, who was about to be replaced, by the way, that was foreshadowing, um, Ray Kasser, Kassar, uh, was just hardcore insider trading, pulling a Yuji Naka, sold 5,000 shares of the company, made a fuck ton of money, and then got, I believe, yeah, indicted for insider trading. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. What's funny about this is that I still get to... It's actually... What's a shame, what's, what's a real shame, is that when people focus on all these these kind of, like, mythical parts of the game's crash, is they forget the real hilarious reality, the truth, which is that, and it's not even a difficult truth to swallow, which is that um, Atari is, like, a terrible company who uh, was always run badly in the game space and basically only got where they were by being early to the market. Did you know? Did did you know that Atari like I I fucking put the timeline together for the first, like I knew these dates and stuff, but I was like Pong was like 1972, 1971. The Atari 2600 was 1977. <laughs> Excuse me. 77. It took them Six years to act on Pong's success. You know what they were doing during that time? Pinball, baby! Pin pinball! Which, to be fair, was, like, pretty lucrative at the time. But it's like, you didn't... What? Uh, and, and a lot of that actually had to do with the fact that, like, they just spent, like, five years... It was, it's so weird when you read the timeline. They, they started development on what would eventually become the 2600. And, like, they made it. They had, like, the product. And then they spent, like, eh, fuck it. Let's just spend, like, four years, three, four years just looking for, like, a distributor, manufacturer. Eh, not a big deal. We got the pinball thing. That's going to last forever. And just, just so many, like... God, Atari has such a bizarre history. I need to do... I want, I'm want. i going to do a video at some point on Atari's history and, like, all these fucking weird decisions that they made. Um, God, what a lightning-in-the-bottle company. <laughs> what, what a fluke of a company. And now they only, all they have to trade on is just their name. Their name. Because people... Oh, yeah, they're, like, the Pong people? Like, that's what people know them as now. Uh, sell blood, you fucks! Sell off the blood license to someone! God, I'm so- I have this fantasy of buying all the Atari token. Hey, remember, like, episode 8 of this podcast when I talked about a uh, Atari token and the Atari hotels? Um, which are real things that they're trying to do? I have this fantasy of, like- because the Atari token it was, like, every other shitcoin where it just- which, by the way, the Atari token was their- 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 Atari's attempt. So the CEO is this like random French guy who loves d d crypto, and he was like, "I'm gonna make a cryptocurrency," and and it it went about as well as you would expect, and it's going for like point oh 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 one cents for like a single Atari token. I'm like, what if I just spent like twenty dollars and bought up the majority of the Atari token? <laughs> The majority of the Atari token supply. I if what if I just bought it all, <laughs> and like, and and like like what would that give me some kind of position? Would I become some sort of majority stockholder in the company, and then I could, I would totally. I just have this fantasy. Like I would want to write like a movie script about this, randomly buying this shit coin. That happens to like give you like a a, a million like like a like a some sort of position of authority at the company, and uh, why? <laughs> and and trying to tr to like like negotiate it like okay I'll sell you it back, 
but I want blood. I want to bargain for the blood IP. I don't want to sell it. I want to buy it. <laughs> um, th that's that's like my dream. I'm not taking anything else. I forget what other stuff they own. I don't care. I don't care about that. I want blood. God damn it. Um, yeah. So interesting article. There's a couple other things that that they go into with. Um, Lots of common miscon. Apparently, this is really fun. Here's another thing. Um, Nintendo uh, was looking for a... Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Where is the point? Where they, uh, they talk about it. Uh, Nintendo was looking for a distributor uh, slash like manufacturer. Um, there we go. Or is it? Uh, yep. Atari was... Up, uh, Nintendo was looking for a distributor for the Famicom in the early 80s uh, to distribute it internationally. And Atari was, like, one of the people who was, like, in the running for it. They could... It could have been, the, like, the Atari Entertainment System. It could have been that, or, or at least been like the distributor or something like that. The Nintendo Atari, I don't know. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and guess what? In the, during the 1983 Consumer Electronics Show, uh, Atari saw that uh, the Donkey Kong was running on a Coleco Atom computer! <laughs> Who was one of their competitors! And they were like, though they, nah, well, fuck you, Nintendo, we're gonna, we're, fuck you. And then, then, uh, they did the same. It's funny because they basically, in the, it, it's really poetic, actually, because that's how Nintendo became, like, the dominant console manufacturer worldwide. And then Nintendo did the exact same thing Atari did when they uh, turned down the deal with Philips and Philips went to make fucking PlayStation with Sony. It happened again and Nintendo made their biggest competitor. <laughs> and they fucked themselves over because the N64 had to use cartridges instead of discs. <laughs> it's maddening. I love video game history. It's so funny. It's so funny. Uh, uh, yeah, a couple, let's see, yeah, the, 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 the idea of, like, oh, there's too many consoles, and they said something that, that was kind of, like, I thought about it, and I was like, that actually makes a lot of sense. Most of the consoles that people point out, let's be honest, there were not many competitors. It's like, you know, it, it, it's like, it's like the fucking ooya, <laughs> right? Like... It was, there was definitely more space in the console market at that point because, you know, it was a new market and everything. People were vying to, to get a share of the market, but Atari controlled 80% of the market. There's not a lot of room left for other people. All these, like, little, the Intellivision, ColecoVision, those are maybe the ones that people remember, but there's just, there's a million random little ones that, like, yeah, no, I think they had, like, fucking Mattel had had a something like that. Um, uh, yeah, and it's like... Yeah, the Mattel... Oh, the Mattel, yeah, the Mattel was in television. In Ma the Ma Mattelevision. The Fairchild, the Bally Astrocade, the Odyssey 2. Um, a lot of these... Yeah, the, these there's some cool things on these, right? They're kind of cool. They're, they are kind of cool, but they are not... They are not uh, super significant players in the game, especially as time time wore on. So, uh, yeah, it, 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 fascinating, interesting article. I'd recommend. You know, I, I've sort of gone over a lot of it, but but the um, uh, a lot of just debunking a lot of the myths of the game's crash, and and um, I would recommend it, it's good. It'll, it'll be linked below. As always, it'll be linked below. If you're curious about reading it, I would recommend it. And kind of the sort of the conclusion is that real or the, that I drew out of it was was that really it was um, Atari just kind of stopped. I mean, they say about it as much basically. Like, yeah, console sales went down because no one was making console games. That the market just 
stopped being there. It was really less of a crash and and more of a blip, I guess. More of a uh, more of a like a weird little diversion. I don't know. It's so fun. I don't know where. Do, I wonder where this comes from. I guess that there's like you know. Uh, uh, like I said, a, a, a console bias, a severe console bias uh, when people talk about gaming history. But, like, I just, like, is that really, like, it? Like, there's so many... <laughs> I think people just... I don't know where the story came from. Um, I don't know where the story came from, but it was, like... Yeah, it, it's... That that there, this was some like John. It might honestly. Hey, I'm willing to. May, maybe it was really just. Maybe we could chalk it all up to a uh, big fucking nerds are over dramatic about stuff and they want to make something sound really big and important and and dramatic, <laughs> so they call it the Great Video Game Crash of 1983, with like a hundred asterisks behind it. Uh, yeah. Uh, fucking, I'm doing a video right now on a bunch of very influential, popular games that came out in 1983. Like, yeah, no, the fuck, uh, the, the, what, what else came, Ultima 4 came out in 83, bunch of shit came out in 83. Uh, like, this was not an industry in decline. This was one company being poorly run that had too much of the market. <laughs> uh, just honestly just deciding to like having had going into a bit of a tizzy because of their ceo and then the new ceo decided to step out of the the, the the console uh industry for a bit yeah like that's what happened a lot of people don't even realize that atari made computers they don't even realize that atari had like home computers the atari the, the, the whole like atari 800 uh, the whole atari 8 bit 800 uh uh, uh line there's a lot of it's, it's a good system there's a lot of good 800 games you know I like the Atari 800 <laughs> uh, more than the 2600, to be honest. I, uh, yeah. Um, all right. Good read. There's a hilarious. Um, I, my, my, I, I was made aware of a hilarious Wikipedia article. Uh, it is called the list of video games considered artistic. Just soak it in for a second. Just soak it in. The list of video games considered artistic. <laughs> the list of video games considered autistic. Uh, ooh, my neck. Um, <laughs> this, dude, you read that title and you're like, oh, oh, no. Oh, we're going back here. Are we go? Uh. And it's so funny because, like, you look at this list. Okay, so... Reading from, what, what's their criteria? This is a list of video games considered to be works of art by art critics and video game reviewers. <laughs> Although several countries, that's how you know it's going to be good. Although several countries offer legal protections to video games which are similar or identical to protect protections offered to other artistic works. And al although this, by this standard, all video games can be sitter, considered as art. <laughs> There's a separate page for video games as an art form, interestingly. Um, this article lists games that have been specifically identified by art critics and video game reviewers as works of art. So basically, like, basically meaningless. I'm so excited to read this list to you guys. The term art game, which we don't really use that much is you is as used in reference to a distinct genre of video games was first used academically in 2002 this list does not include visual novels which are considered an independent art form within the video game industry uh spoiler alert there is a visual novel on the list <laughs> oh okay so this list is really funny because you go down and, and the, a lot of the picks are good. And they, what's great is they have descriptions for each of them of, of like justifying why they're they're on the list. A lot of these picks are like they're good games. Tempest, Super Mario Brothers, Another World, Mist, Doom. Interestingly. And and here's 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 how vapid and empty this list is. Here's what makes Doom a uh, uh, a game that is considered artistic. 
because the Guardian editor, the Guardian games editor, Keith Stewart, described it as uh, the natural heir to the splatterhouse cinema of the pre-digital era. He basically said, hey, it's really gory, like some movies are gory. And whoever put together this fucking list was like, that means it's like art, dude. That's like art. <laughs> Uh, oh, Tempest is really funny. The PBS Idea channel described it as a strongly aesthetic experience, comparing it to painting. <laughs> um, and there's just a bunch. Uh, Chrono Trigger, Yoshi's Island, Super Mario 64, Symphony of the Night, Odd World, Abe's Odyssey, uh, Final Fantasy VII. Um, <laughs> dude, Final Fantasy VII. This is such... It's almost adorable the way this list is written. Considered by many to be one of the best role-playing video games of all time, its story includes the death of a major character, which aimed to give the player an emotional stake in the game. <laughs> it had never been done before. There had never been another game where uh, an important character died. Not like uh, the two, sorry, three Final Fantasy games before this. Wait, no. Four has it too. Four, five, six all have major character deaths that are, or, or attempts at deaths that are, are extremely emotionally compelling. Fuck, especially six. You know the scene. You know the scene I'm talking about. Um, no one had ever done this before. Oh my god. Uh, Grim Fandango, Oddworld, Abe's Exodus, Panzer Dragoon Saga, let's go, Xeno Gears, Planescape Torment, and Vib Ribbon. And then two, okay, so that's broken up by, uh, by kind of, like, time periods? That was all 20th century, and now we have 2000 to 2005. Okay, sure. Uh, Deus Ex, uh, <laughs> excuse me, Deus Ex, uh, Galatea, which is, like, a interactive fiction game, uh, Max Payne, Silent Hill 2, not Silent Hill, just, just Silent Hill 2, uh, uh, Eco or Ico? Metal Gear Solid 2. Not Metal Gear Solid 1. Just 2. Um, Wind Waker, Yume Nikki, The Endless Forest, Killer 7. <laughs> oh, we stay winning. Uh, Pathologic, Psychonauts. Then again, in the 2006 to 2010. Okami, Shadow of the Col You know, there's a lot of like obvious ones here, right? Okami, Shadow of the Colossus. Mother 3, which I totally didn't realize came out in 2006. I made sense. I'm like, yeah, it's a GBA game, but I, I always, I don't know, I, I didn't realize it came out that much after uh, Earthbound or Mother 2. I guess it makes sense because Earthbound 64 was like this never really happened, obviously. Um, Dwarf Fortress. That's a kind of, it's an interesting pick. Uh, not sure exactly what makes it artistic, but... Uh, Oh, oh, here's what makes it artistic. Here's the citation. It's because it's on the PBS Idea Channel's um, video of the top five most artful video games. <laughs> Amazing. Bioshock. <laughs> um, I love how it's like a spiritual successor to System Shock 2. Um, but they don't have System Shock 2 or 1. System Shock 1 does not get enough credit. Oh, I'm, I'm plugging System Shock 1 again. I apologize. Um, Portal, Fallout 3, Braid, Windowsill, Flower, Nobi Nobi Boy, The Path. We got a couple heavy hitters in a row. Deadly Premonition. Let's fucking go. <laughs> Deadly Premonition. <laughs> Yeah, boys. Swear he stays winning. <laughs> oh my god. Um, fuck, dude. Deadly Premonition is. I feel like it's a game. You either like it or you don't. You either. <laughs> Which sound that might sound obvious, but no. There's like a there's a, a steep difference between people who gel with it, people who don't. I fucking love Deadly Premonition. I haven't gotten the chance to play it. But the parts that I have seen of it, I've seen like the first few hours of the game, and it seems, oh my, it, it's, it's at least the presentation, maybe the game itself, maybe the game itself. Hey, what was my last episode? I'm like, oh, big fan, never played it. Maybe I'll feel different when I play it, but just, just the fucking humor 
that scene where the main character is like sitting across from like the hotel lady who owns the hotel and it's just like there's just like a minute of silence and the fucking song is playing in the background it is extremely my sense of humor (laughs) deadly premonition and then the one-two punch heavy rain let's fucking go heavy rain ah Dude, I think the most scathing thing I ever heard anyone say about Heavy Rain is that I it was a uh, J- Jim Stephanie Sterling. I, they were talking about the um I uh, I don't know. I forget what the topic was. But like how low a lot of standards for for stories are in games and just the Fucking dude, go back and read the reviews for Heavy Rain when it came out. It's in it's ridiculous. It's so funny. And and it's like it's from the era this whole list feels like it's from this era where game journalists were like they felt really you could tell there was a lot of games journalists. Like I don't like generalizing people, but there's a lot of them who felt like they they felt like insecure about the fact that they wrote about video games for a living. And so they, they like, <laughs> they went through, there was this like phase of insecurity where they were like, no, no, mom, mom, dad, no, no. Like, it's like an art form. It's like, it's like art. I'm like writing about art. It's like, I'm like, uh, duh. No, there's this game. It's called Heavy Rain. It's like a movie. You guys know movies, right? It's like a movie, but you like play it. it it's like a movie. It's like, it's like real art. <laughs> God damn. And, and, and what Sterling said about it was uh this is like the most biting hurtful thing i've ever heard it was lucky heavy rain was lucky it was a video game <laughs> fuck that it's that's me right in the gut dude <laughs> ouch but it's so true it's so true i saw a great because there's that because that forespoken game came out so people were like complaining about the dialogue and someone was like, dude, you guys haven't even played a David Cage game. And someone linked like a clip from like a Heavy Rain, from like a scene from Heavy Rain where it's like co- main cop guy is, uh, excuse me. <laughs> He's like pointing at gun at some, at some dude in like a warehouse, the guy's on the ground and it's the dialogue. It sounds like it's some out of some like low, like some like throwaway cop procedural that would be on like daytime television. And what I found was really funny was that like the audio engineering, because it like doesn't exist. It's literally like they're in this big warehouse and they both sound like they're just in a room. Like, you can hear, they sound like me. They sound like they're just talking in a room. There's no echo. There's no kind of reverb or anything applied to their voices. You can, like, hear the echo of the fucking recording booth. It's so funny. Uh, Other gate, let's see. Limbo. Amnesia. Uh, Now we're on to 2011, 2015. L.A. Noir. Child of Eden. The Cat and the Coup. Papa when yo, dear Esther, Gravity Rush, Journey, Unfinished Swan, uh, Spec Ops: The Line, The Walking Dead, uh, an episodic adventure game. Yeah, The Walking Dead has been praised for its story, meaningful character decisions, and believable character. It is often considered one of the greatest examples of storytelling in video games. I'm gonna go on a little rant right now, and I was thinking about this the other day. I I read okay. I was looking for, like, examples of, like, what are the earliest forms of, like, storytelling in, in gaming? And I found this essay that I might have been given as a GDC talk. I think it was on the GDC website or something like that. About It was called The Evolution of Storytelling in Gaming. This it was a terrible essay. Like, it was really bad. Um, the examples made no sense. It went from, like, Donkey Kong to Crash Bandicoot to Skyrim. And that was, like, their complete timeline. It was really bad. It was really poorly put together um and i was not impressed with the analysis and it was very clear that the author uh was basically had like a very cursory knowledge of like gaming history and was basically just like they really thought they had an idea of of what came out you know 
uh, 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 they really thought that they understood it. And they, in actuality, they spent most of it just talking about recent games. This is from a, a couple years ago. And it was just recent games they had played that had a lot of story in it. And they were talking about, like, Life is Strange. And Life is Strange is a game that I don't particularly care for. Um... And and I think part of that, and and I think part of my aversion maybe to like The Walking Dead and 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 the Telltale games, it's not like an outright dislike of them. I don't like Life is Strange as dialogue. I think it sounds really fucking bad. Um, that's a personal taste. I don't really know that much about The Walking Dead story, but here's what annoys me about not the games. I I, I should mention that. Uh, I, so okay, so the part that I get frustrated at. It's not the games themselves. What I get frustrated at is when people refer to them as these like monumental steps forward in the in video games and the way that games, the way that their stories are presented or and like storytelling and oh my god, it's an evolution of storytelling in games. And I look at them and I'm like, I look at like The Walking Dead and the Telltale games and I'm like, this is just a choose your own adventure book. That's what this is. This is a choose-your-own-adventure book adapted into a game. And that doesn't mean that it's bad. I don't want to imply that, because it's not what I mean. And if you like them, that's not an issue. I totally believe that there's great writing in the Walking Dead games, at the very least. Um, I, I 100% like believe when people tell me that they're really well-written. I'm not questioning that. And I'm not criticizing the games of the people who enjoy them. What I'm criticizing is the, 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 the discussion around what they represent. Because I think it's completely misguided. It's totally false. Um, uh, I, and I think as time has shown, no, it was not an evolution of storytelling in games. It was just, oh, now we know how to do this kind of a thing in games. It is... It is it is, when I think of something that's an evolution of storytelling in games, I generally, here's my sticking point for The Walking Dead and, and things like that, is that you don't really need to, like, play the games to know the games. You have to, like, you can absorb everything in, in those games perfectly well, by like, by like, watching a let's play of them, and I kind of take issue with that kind of praise for games that I don't think have to be games. If that makes sense, I realize that like maybe it's a little hypocritical because like I haven't played it. Maybe I haven't played it. I'm willing to admit that. Um, I just don't know what more I would get out of playing them if I had already watched the games, right? And if you have played them, or if you've only... If you watched it... If you watched, like, a Let's Play of one of these kinds of games, and then you went and played it, tell me, actually, like, was that experience... Like, do you feel like you were... Oh, once you played it, you were like, oh... I, this is, there's a whole part of this experience that I was not getting just watching a Let's Play. Because when I think of, like, a, a game I actually consider, like, a, a, a real, like, one of the best examples of, like, boundary-pushing kind of storytelling in games. I think of Deus Ex. I think about that game pretty often ever since I've played it. And I, I think about it, and, and I realize that, like, Deus Ex could only have been a game. It, it doesn't work in any other medium. And the reason for that is, like, yeah, technically you could adapt the literal story into, like, a book or a TV series. Not a movie. God, it would be way too long. Um, but, like, yeah, you could adopt the literal plot, right? But one of the most important things about Deus Ex is that you're playing it. It's that you have... The thing that was so innovative about it at the time was that it, it, it was... It it, 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 it it was a new kind of game in the sense that it, it gave you this degree of freedom of how you wanted to to tackle uh, uh, to tackle the game 
in 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 so many like every single situation has, has so many different ways that you can go about it and the reason that is is because the entire game is about choice not just gameplay wise but like thematically story wise uh, uh deus ex is is, is there's uh, is like fundamentally a game about asking the player questions not just through like the story but the game as well like the design of the levels the game the, when when the game asks you these questions like 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 should human beings even be allowed to govern themselves Th that is like the same it's the same principle as like like should human beings have the choice to govern themselves like what what who should be allowed to control things how much should we should how much power should we have over our lives right um <clears throat> and the, the 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 there's so many like thematic things in the plot itself that 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 reflect that but in the gameplay it's expressed in the gameplay the game literally asks you questions of how are you going to accomplish this mission how are you going to do this are you going to like take this kind of a route are you going to take that kind of a route what kind of items will you use will you uh how will you manipulate the behavior of the guards uh how violent are you going to be uh, the entire game is about giving the player choice like 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 these are very intentional. This was not accidental that these two things c coalesce so well. These two aspects of the game coalesce so well is to the point where it's 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 practically like a singular thing. Uh, uh, Deus Ex was a story that they wanted to tell about choice, and the game had to be like this. It had to give you the the an unprecedented level of freedom in how you chose to play it, because otherwise, if if the game was stiff. You wouldn't feel that choice. You wouldn't feel the themes. You 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 play the themes of the game, and and ultimately you are given the choices in the story that like the the game the game allows you to make this. One of the the, the 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 main character. The main character JC, is like specifically like there is all this. There's these like hints and dialogues that like he is a special kind of person. He's a special new kind of person. And, and the thing that's special about him is that he gets to make a choice. He gets to make a choice about what his existence means. The player gets to make that choice. Literally, you get to do it. And, and like, I think, I'm like, fuck. That's, like, this could only be a video game. It, it, it would not hit nearly as hard. It would not be nearly as strong or, 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 or symbolic if, if it was if you were just watching this play out on the screen as just a disconnected audience member you have to be JC you have to be him for it to work that's what's so incredible about it uh, uh, go play Deus Ex God damn it <laughs> I, I get annoyed when when I see these games that are basically just like this could have just been a book this could have been a choose your own adventure book with very good writing. With good characters, with 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 competent storytelling, good voice acting, you know, whatever, what have you. But like, it didn't have to be a game. And to be fair, not everything has to be a game, right? Not everything has to be just has to be so unique that it has to be just a a a, a, a game. Like, there's a lot of fuck, eh, movies, there's a lot of movies, television series. They could have been anything else. Um, music is on, honestly kind of hard to adapt into other 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 stuff but but like plenty of things that i would consider great in other mediums you know that that don't have to be don't have to be what they are right uh this is one of the problems with like berserk a lot of adaptations of berserk is that like uh, there's decent adaptations there's good adaptations of berserk but like the manga feels like there's just this like the atmosphere and there's mood in the manga that comes from it being black and white and the way the Mura uses like uh, uh, the 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 qualities of manga the, the fact that you're turning a page the fact that he can just draw a scene and the viewer's eye can just linger on it and you can just kind of like explore this incredibly detailed panel he's created um and 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 like the way that he communicates emotion is so specific to the medium of like comics, right? The medium of manga. It's so specific, um, and you can you can adapt 
you can competently adapt that, but you can't get the whole thing. You can't get the full picture. I don't mean unless you were I don't know really creative, but but um, and had a lot of budget <laughs> and time. But yeah, I don't know. I I I I I have a, I have a lot of admiration. I think that's probably why I lean very heavily towards games that are very, let's say, gameplay focused. As a lot of people would describe it. I, a lot of my favorite games are very gameplay focused. Like Tetris, Doom, Blood, um, fighting games. You know these kinds of things because because to me it's like you they they can't be anything but games, and 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 the things that they evoke are unique. Excuse me, are unique to the medium. There's like a very special connection. There's like a feeling. I remember the first time I played Doom. And this was back when I was like uh, not, I just eh, didn't really care about FPS games. And, and I remember getting the shotgun for the first time and like turning a corner. There was an imp there and I just fucking blasted him. And this fucking little dinky little game from 1993 made me feel insane. I w- The feeling, I was like, <gasps> The first time I ever shot an imp with the shotgun in Doom, I was like, oh! Like the, you know, that gif of, uh, of, uh, 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 little man, little guy. Um, who's a little guy? Who's, who's that little gentleman with the, with the egg? Uh, uh, Danny DeVito, that's his name. You know that gif of Danny DeVito? Where it's like zooming in on him and he goes, I get it now. That was me. That was me when I shot that imp for the first time. I was like, oh, like I, you, you, I just don't get that feeling from anything else, right? You don't get that feeling of connection to the game. Just, oh, oh, the feedback that like I did something in, in this in this medium. It, it's like, it's, it's incredible. It's like I have a very, uh, it's a very special connection to me. And, and I, I appreciate very much games that are, are able to express, that are able to tap into that and and, 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 and and be that. I respect it a lot. Um Yeah. Anything else on this list? What the fuck was I talking about? <laughs> uh let's see. Uh Bioshock Infinite. Oh lordy. Oh lordy. Sorry I just fucked up the audio. I just peaked to hell. Jesus Christ. Oh, here's the justification for Bioshock in- in- Infinite. A first-person shooter set in 1912 in an alternate universe where American exceptionalism is flourishing aboard the flying city Columbia. The game's narrative challenges concepts of nationalism, religion, and racism during that period, providing a, quote, funhouse mirror of American ideological history, according to Ben Popper of The Verge. Oh, you know, Bioshock Infinite, the game that had so much, like, so much uh, weird development with its script over the course of its its uh, creation that it just kind of ends up not really saying anything. It ends up not really, like, just... just say- I still remember that Matthew Matosis video where he's like, they never just, they just never drop the hard R. They're too pussy to just drop the fucking hard R in their game about racism. Like, shut the fuck up. You don't want <laughs> to... Just- Tell me a slur. If you want to actually go hard on this, right? Show, if you want to, like, challenge this shit, be real about it. Don't just, there's, ra- oh my god, look how racist people are. Wow, America. Dog, hit me with that. <laughs> hit me with the baseball. Uh, it's all just a lot of, like, shock and awe and not a lot of substance. GTA Five Papers, Please, Proteus. Uh, Brother to Tale of Two Sons, Gone Home, Stanley Parable, Flappy Bird. Oh, it's because it's in the MoMA, really? (laughs) The Vanishing of Ethan Carter, Kentucky Route Zero, Elegy for a Dead World, Monument Valley, This War of Mine. Apparently, hey, fun fact, apparently this war of mine is now uh, considered, it's put on the reading list in Poland? That's weird. Like, you can write an essay about, like, this war of mine in Poland for school. Uh, the Talos Principle, Never Alone, Pr- uh, Beyond Eyes, Her Story, The Beginner's Guide, Undertale, Ori and the Blind Forest, 2016 to Present, That Dragon Cancer, Abzu, Bound, uh, 1979 Revolution, Black Friday, No, no Man's Sky, 
No Man's Sky. What is the justification? An open-world space exploration game inspired by 1960s and 1970s sci-fi comic books. Players can explore over 18 quintillion procedurally generated planets. Is that why it's art? Ooh, my, ooh, my schnick. Uh, Firewatch, The Witness, Inside, Mafia 3! Mafia 3! <laughs> why Mafia 3? Received praise for exploring controversial themes such as racism and segregation in the southern United States. Mafia 3, no yeah. <laughs> no yeah. <laughs> no, what the heck, no yeah. <laughs> the Last Guardian. Virginia, The Town of Light, Hyperlight Drifter, Night in the Woods, Near Automata, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, The Moose Man, The, the Moose Man, What Remains of Edith Finch, Hollow Knight, Last Day of June, Gora Goa, The Invisible Hours, Kingdom Come Deliverance. Weren't there like, weren't there like, were there Nazis working on this? No, it was, it was, some, it was some weird race thing going on with, with this game. 11-11 uh, Memories Retold. I haven't actually heard of a lot of these. Red Dead Redemption 2. Uh, Return of the Oberdin, Grease, Manifold Garden, Death Stranding, Disco Elysium, Untitled Goose Game, The Last of Us. Part 2. <laughs> Not part 1, just part 2. <laughs> just part 2. Ghost of Tsushima, Hades, Before Your Eyes. I don't know, uh, I don't know what they're doing. Um, oh, yeah, that's the one that's controlled by your blinks. Yeah, that, I think that was really interesting. Um, yeah, so, like, the funny thing about this list is, like, you can hem and haw about it as much as you want, but the fact that it exists at all is, like, a complete fallacy. The whole criteria for the list even existing is is this thing which I just really resent, which is this, like, on-your-knees pleading for people to respect you as an art form or something and i'm just like i'm so tired of it i used to care about this like are games art or no games are art i used to care about that argument and it's like now it's like i don't fucking care dude i can't i i i i i i like <laughs> i resonate with it i care about it that's enough for me i really don't care if a bunch of people who work at a museum think what i enjoy is art or something does it really matter it's just it's all this it always just feels like it's it's just rooted in this like insecurity even if it let's say it's not art okay who gives a fuck i don't care <laughs> this just this it feels straight out of that like that um that era right that that seventh gen era of like trying to justify why you play video games because no actually they're super like adult and mature have you seen heavy rain it's like a movie uh <laughs> the talk page is very funny uh because so someone says <laughs> so so our username mabel comments everything in my head is just screaming no as i am looking at the concept for this article perhaps at least a rename to list of video games currently referred to as artistic would be an improvement but like it's not it's such a meaningless the current title surely suggests a lot of things about the definition of art someone says no objections here the guy who made the list again has not been this is these comments were back in 2017. Our name of the article was not changed. Uh, there's this guy who's just, like, talking about, like, his idea of art and how, like, Doom is not art because it's, like, violent and it's not... It's not a... It's it's not... It's it's not a transcendent, sublime experience. Dog, I felt sublime. You don't feel sublime when you're circle strafing in Doom? Dude, you've got no soul. Uh... Let's see. There's some other funny ones. Uh, reverse. There's, here's a topic on the talk page. Reverse time deletion. I'd like to nominate this page for deletion. 
but not just regular deletion. Is there some sort of way to retcon reality so that this page never existed and everyone who witnessed it gets a Men in Black style memory wipe? I'm not familiar with all the features of Wikipedia. Followed up by another user saying, Seconded, please erase this article from reality. 100% agree. Uh, I'd agree. Uh, someone else writes, I'd agree if it isn't completely reworked. It isn't inherently an awful article conceptually, but there are just too many games on this list with just awful citations. Um, to which someone replies, it is, it is pretty awful conceptually. Imagine a page called List of Paintings Considered Artistic. That's where I have to disagree. This article is irredeemably pointless. Jesus. And it's like... We should do, like... I should do, like, a funny thing. I should do, like, a video where I just go through, like, every game ever released and call it art. So to just flood this list. Because <laughs> that's all they need. All they need is just someone said it. It's such a fucking pointless... Someone said... There's no authorities on art, dude. That's not, like... <laughs> like, on, like, what is or isn't art, right? There's obviously like art history and stuff like that and knowledge of technique and things, but like what counts the, f no, get out of here. That's dumb. That's why I like, I think of the videos that I make as, as art and I don't want that to come off as, as sounding pretentious because to be honest, it's not a high praise. Uh, anyone can make art. You can make art right now. Is it art that many people are going to appreciate? Maybe not. But you can do it. You can make it. It's not hard to make art. <laughs> Anyone can. It's why, I don't know, it's not like a super useful... It's not a very useful word, in my opinion. Art. Uh, yeah, hey, speaking of art, I had a funny little, uh, little funny... Not really that funny, now that I think about it. I was having a little think... I was thinking about this the other day, because remember when I'm back on the podcast when I talk about Puss in Boots? Because I keep seeing people bring it up, because uh, it is a, a quite good movie, right? Um, and there's people who are, like, actually kind of, like, going out and saying, hey, this is a good movie, you should go watch it. Um, so it's been in my mind, and I realized I completely forgot to talk about this during the podcast, but, like... There is a very realistic depiction of a panic attack in Puss in Boots The Last Wish, which I was not expecting. Um, and I think that it's kind of funny that I forgot about that because I myself suffered from pretty severe anxiety um, uh, uh, for most of my life. And... I think what I, I think what I, the reason I forgot about it is that I spent a lot of time in that scene, uh, getting stressed out by the heartbeat sound they were playing. I had this like severe misophonia of heartbeat sounds, like, like it j for some reason. It's not like usual ones, like oh, people don't like high pitched screeching noises. Like yeah, that's obvious. It hurts your ears. I just hate heartbeat sounds. I don't know why. It, it makes me... I don't know. It, it freaks me out. I, I hate the sound of it. And they play that during that scene. Uh, so, like, the movie is... is one. Of, so, like, to, to quickly recap... Uh, Puss basically has, like, a brush with, like, the literal embodiment of death in this movie. Um, and he's on his last life. And his whole the whole motivation in his in the movie is that he wants to get this la this wishing star so that he can he can get his lives back he's actually terrified of death and they kind of like um foreshadow it a little bit where like he uh like the hairs on his on his body stand up and and that's sort of like his tell when he can feel like it's death is nearby and there's a point where he has like the closest encounter with death in the entire film and and he he like escapes and he's just running and running and running and running, uh, and then he just like ends up once he's escaped he just kind of like sits against this tree just breathing super heavily and like he can't think his heart is just beating out of his chest and 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 uh, and and the only thing that calms it down is the little dog that comes by, the little dog character and he pets him and kind of calms down a little bit, and it's a very very like real depiction of of what a, an actual anxiety attack looks like um and i was thinking about that and i thought how how 
how novel it was, really. And I think that's what's strange. Because I, I was thinking about this, and I'm like, depression and anxiety are probably the most well-known mental, like, uh, uh, what would you call it? Mental illnesses that people have, right? Uh, uh, disorders, whatever you want to. I don't know what the I don't know what the right term is for it, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, and I think it's really interesting the disparity between how much art there is that depicts and expresses and explores depression compared to anxiety. And I thought that's really interesting. Like there's all this like if I just say to you, imagine in in a, for a moment like like stock photo ang- uh, stock photo depression <laughs> right stock photo depression what pops into your mind uh someone in a gray hoodie sitting against a wall with their head down dark lighting all that you, you know exactly what i'm talking about right being really sad we have this like really clear image in our in our society and our culture of what depression looks like. But weirdly enough, despite the fact that a lot of people suffer from anxiety, we don't have nearly as good of an idea of what that looks like. And I think there's a couple reasons for that. Um uh, uh, the, the where how should I start? Um I think one of the biggest ones, if we're going to talk about like artistic depictions, right? Is it like, so think about like, okay, art that's sad. Let's just talk about music, for instance. Sad music. I love sad music. Modest Mouse is my favorite band ever. Um, And and when people listen to sad music, generally, obviously everyone's experience might be different, but generally the appeal of sad music isn't that it makes you sad. It's that it expresses things that you're feeling. It expresses your sadness. It's actually cathartic. A lot of people, myself included, will listen to sad music when we're feeling sad and 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 and, and depressed, or we're going through a hard time, and it makes us, uh, it helps us kind of process our emotions better. Um. In in a funny way, listening to depressing music can actually like make you feel better. Right? It can make bring you back into maybe not happy, but more of like a balanced state. <laughs> Excuse me, emotionally. Uh whereas on the flip side, art that expresses and explores anxiety just makes you feel more anxious. <laughs> like it's like the opposite of what you would want. <laughs> Usually I feel like if 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 you feel anxious you need something distracting or soothing, like the opposite emotions, rather than like leaning into it. Leaning into it's scary, um, uh, and and so like it's a lot harder to make art. I think that that expresses it in a way that's actually helpful and cathartic to people who experience anxiety. Uh, like, I went years, I went years, I went until I was, like, 18, 19, without even realizing that I had, an, that I, I had, I've had anxiety my whole life. Um, and that I was having, pa- I've been having panic attacks since I was, like, four years old. I didn't even realize that, because I literally didn't know what it looked like. I know what, like, depression looks like, and I knew that even when I was sad and I felt depressed in, like, it was in an acute way, right? I didn't have anything really long-term, um, really long-term, like, deep set like that. I, I, I doubt I could, I would be die. I was too, I don't know, I was too happy most of the time, honestly. I, I genuinely did not feel, I don't think I was ever, uh, depressed in, like, a chronic way, but I did have some real anxiety issues. I never knew. I never knew that it was weird to like go through that I, I i or not weird but i never knew that it was like out of the ordinary that you know, maybe there was something wrong uh and i wonder like if i if i had more accurate depictions of what it looks like maybe i would have realized it sooner like oh wait i ha- wait what is that not 
everyone doesn't feel like that. Because to me, my anxiety just made sense. My anxiety, it was irrational, but it, it, it felt rational. Um, which, which is what makes it, it made it really hard to recognize and, and, and kind of start trying to like uh, fix. Was that it seems rational and it seems normal to, well, to me at least, it seemed normal. Uh, and like, oh yeah, this just makes sense. People just don't talk about it for whatever reason. Uh, but no, like, no, it's not good. <laughs> uh, there, there's, like, other reasons that I think we see uh, more instances of, like, depression. And they're a little, it's a little more cynical, I think. Which is that, like, for instance, um, it's a lot easier to tell stories with, like, depression as a point. As, like, a, a, a an element in it. Like it, it's 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 e it's easy. I feel like it's easier to depict someone as being depressed than it is anxious. Like so, it's what even if it's not entirely accurate, it's easier to like communicate that to to an audience. So someone's depressed. They're sad all the time. They're glum. They're they can't get out of bed. They're they're depressed. It's obvious, right? They're, they're it's 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 easy. Um, when I was experiencing anxiety, anxiety is like. For me, at least, it wasn't like an all the time thing. It was uh, you spend most of the day trying like really desperately to stave off intrusive thoughts that are going to trigger an anxiety attack. Uh, and you just kind of try to distract yourself with other things, uh, hoping that that day you won't have an attack. <laughs> it's it's not. It, it that's it doesn't it's not obvious <laughs> that's what it looks like also on to that point uh depression has a very clear climactic event which is the obvious thing <laughs> that you're thinking of that i don't know if it's in good taste for me to say um uh, it's, it, when you you know when you try when you try to you know um a very clear, which is funny because, uh, from what I understand, that's really not like in fiction that'll be presented many times as like a climax. But for most people, that actually ends up being like, assuming they hopefully survive. Um, I hope you know they survive. Uh, ends up being the middle of 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 their journey. Their attempt is uh, is is more is ends up often more times being like a catalyst for them to get help. And, uh, uh, or, or to like improve, or it, it's not, or it might happen multiple times, who knows? It's not really accurate to depict it as like, this is the end, and now that we stopped you, you're good now. It's like, but it's easy to depict it like that, right? It's really dramatic because someone's literally going to die. Um, uh, an anxiety attack, you know, people get to like cry, they get in, in like a, you know, in a, Let's go back a couple words. Pre, not talking about anxiety. Talking about the depression thing. People get to cry. Oh my god! You got a dramatic scene. Someone opening, busting open the door to stop that. You know, you get it's really dramatic, right? When an anxiety attack is like, oops, I saw something, or I had a weird thought that like triggered an, a panic attack, um, and then that 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 lasts for about a minute, uh, where I feel like I'm gonna die. And then I spend the next few hours uh, just kind of in bed trying to uh, distract myself <laughs> from what just happened. And I'm kind of just put out of commission for like half the day. It's not... What I'm trying to say is that depression is a, is a much sexier... <laughs> it's much sexier than anxiety. It's been made that way at the very least. It's been more, much more romanticized than anxiety, and I think that's I don't know. It's kind of it's kind of interesting. Like it's kind of sexy to be sad, and like and 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 depressed. Not when you're on that. Not when you're going through it. But oh, from an outsider's perspective. Oh wow! How ooh how whatever you know. It's associated with all this like deepness and meaningfulness. Anxiety just like very clearly just ruins your fucking life. <laughs> um, I hope that I'm not coming across as like I'm minimizing people with depression. This is more so like the de way it's depicted that I, I, I think is also, a, also in itself a problem, right? That, that 
we there's depictions of of depression that are are very that are overly romanticized and and kind of put sort of wrong or misleading ideas into people's minds about how it works and things like that i'm just speaking from the perspective of someone who went who dealt with a lot of anxiety problems and uh realized that there was not a lot of like representation for that and in a weirdly imbalanced way uh it's i don't know it's it's uh i think it's interesting it's something i would like to see more i'm surprised that 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 puss in boots the last wish was the movie to do it but i did genuinely feel like wow that felt really like whoever wrote it or at least went through that or at least was it advised by someone who who's who's suffered from that kind of a of a panic attack uh yeah Ooh, a lot of muscles i haven't stretched um I felt nice yeah that's I don't know. I just I was thinking about it. I, I I wish there was more. I think it would be I think it would be helpful. I think seeing things that you go through. I mean, for how common it 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 is. I I I don't even remember. Like I went through a lot of uh, mental health stuff when I was in um in high school. I, but it, like well, I mean like education wise. Like I went through a lot of like we had health class and we learned about. We had a whole big part of the, her, my health class was talking about mental health. Right. We obviously did you know physical health. And all that, but but a lot of it was also mental health. They made it's like a point now in education to talk about mental health. At least where at least where I went to school. And uh, I I don't know if we we talked a lot about like depression and obviously like you know mood imbalance and things like that, emotional like homeostasis and and ways that that you know the way that like um for instance like a bipolar condition works and how you go from like down to up and 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 up and down and and, and stuff like that the the brain overcorrecting for certain emotions all that kind of thing we talked about how to talk to people who are feeling like you know heavily depressed uh what to do if you're feeling depressed what to do if you're if you're feeling if you're having like a suicidal ideation we talked a lot about that um and 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 it felt at least the impression that i got from my experience in high school was that there was definitely like a lot of care for people uh, who are going through that um and if you are going through that i i uh i uh yeah love <laughs> I, I, feel, oh, I feel the need to say that um i don't remember that much talk about anxiety it's just i i don't it's weird it's like we don't really know i don't know i think it would be nice to like have a a little more awareness awareness for that maybe i'll be the guy maybe i'll be the i'll be mr anxiety <laughs> And I'll be the one to talk about it. The guy who was never actually diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. Yeah, that's right. I was never diagnosed, but uh, I don't really feel like talking about it right now because it's like a whole big story. But uh, I, I think I would. I think you would have a hard time uh, saying that I did not have some form of anxiety uh, with the way that I, I um, <laughs> the way that I, I felt what was happening in my life <clears throat> um i don't know what i would get I, I went to therapy and hey it fixed it uh yeah so uh not a lot more to say about that <laughs> it's kind of it i, I wish there was more re representation more visibility i guess um yeah it's also i guess that's the other thing is it's hard to kind of rally like there's always a big mental health rally whenever someone obviously, you know, takes their own life. There's a big mental health rally. And uh, it's hard to, like, get, like, a big unifying thing like that for anxiety. You don't usually... Unless you have, like, a full-on heart attack, which... I don't know how common that is, but, but like... It's not as clear-cut, right? Especially if you're a young person. I imagine it would be pretty pretty hard to actually be in the position where your body was vulnerable to an actual having an actual heart attack from an anxiety a panic attack um <clears throat> yeah anyway <laughs> let's think about that this week uh so i played through portal 2 uh finished portal 1 last week and this week was uh and then like 
like the next day or something, I, I played through Portal 2. I did it in like two sessions, basically, uh, over two days. And it's also weird. I think what I was struggling to articulate last time was that I... Um, because of my weird, unique kind of history with the Portal series, I feel like I've already had, like, the fact that I've already watched them all on YouTube, right? I've already gone through, like, my emotions with the series. I've already gone through everything. And, and it's almost like what's so difficult about, about trying to talk about them is that play, actually playing them almost feels like a formality. It feels like, well, now I'm just going through the motions. You know, we've already... We've already made the decision. We're just going through the ceremony kind of kind of thing. Um, and and it's weird because I want to say that they're both great games. I want to say they're both they're both great. Uh, Portal Two has has a, a, a good. Pu I'm also not the best. I'm not a super adept puzzler, right? Um, I'm not like a super. Uh, I'm not a not an experienced puzzle gamer, so I don't know if I can really give give a good size up of like what's a good puzzle, what's a bad puzzle. I can at least say from someone who tries to kind of you know think about the way that the games are designed, um, good like introducing interesting mechanics, doing lots of puzzles with them, and 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 really pushing a lot of these concepts that they introduce like. Uh, like name, like the gels are pretty interesting. Um, uh, I like the way that those are used. Like, really stumped me on a couple ones. I think that overall it was more difficult than Portal One, just in the fact that there were like certain puzzles that like I, there was there was more puzzles that I got stuck on for longer. When I'm is really what it came down to. Um, I can see potentially some people not quite enjoying uh, the parts of the game that are not just straight puzzling. Uh, so, like, this, Portal 2 has a much more involved story than Portal 1. Uh, there's more dialogue. There's a whole other character. <laughs> um, GLaDOS is obviously, like, there's a big, like, half the game she's, like, talking to you directly, right? From the potato. Uh... And, and and there's these segments because of that where you aren't really doing puzzling, but you're like going through the facility. You're maybe shooting a portal here or there to move, but it's not really like doing the puzzles. And I can see some people getting annoyed with that. Personally, I didn't mind. Um, I actually enjoyed, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the entire game. And... Um, I, I I I found a lot to like in the way that it was paced. Uh, it's it's it, it it if I had to describe it, it's kind of like the first game, but operating at a much larger scale on all fronts. The game is longer. I mean, it got it's like three times longer. It took me like six seven hours to make to beat. It's longer. Um, there's more characters. There's way more story. Uh, in like the environments are bigger uh you get like all this backstory and there's like character development for wheatley and glados it's just a bigger scaled up game compared to the original um and i can see the arguments for liking one over the other maybe you just like kind of the short simple uh straightforward kind of story and and presentation of the original or you can like really get in like dig into the sort of storyline uh and 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 all these kind of extra sort of st I don't know what you call them set dressing elements maybe the stuff that is not the puzzling in portal 2 although i do think that the puzzling's great in portal 2 um i never got like seriously tripped up i never had to look up like a walkthrough or anything like that um uh yeah, I don't know. It's it's again. It's so hard to size them up, right? To 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 actually kind of analyze how I feel about them because a lot of it was just oh, I remember this. I remember this. I remember this. I didn't really remember a lot of specific puzzle solutions. 
there were some rooms I walked into. I'm like, oh, I remember this room from like a let's play I watched ten years ago, but um, I don't I don't quite remember you know like how the solution and everything. And it was like I don't know it it, it is it is really strange. It's, it's an odd feeling. I realize that I I kind of repeated myself a lot last episode. I just said it was weird, but it it, it is. It's. It's, um, yeah, it, it feels like a formality to kind of go through and actually play the games. And so I want to say that I enjoyed them. I want to say I enjoyed both of them quite a bit. And I do think they're great games, but I almost don't have, like, an emotional attachment to them for that reason. Is that, like, when I, I, I look at, at, at them, when I look at, like, some of my favorite games of all time, I, I didn't... I, a lot of them actually I didn't know about and, and I, I might have even seen like the entire thing but like the ex, I don't know the, the experience was different the experience was different like I uh, I remember I watched Civi 11's video on blood which was how I discovered the game and, and then I actually went and played it and oh god now it's one of my favorite games um you know like that that kind of thing um uh, but, like, I, I don't know if I could honestly say that, like... I... I it's weird. Yeah, I've already had my, like, emotional time with it. It's almost like I'm replaying it at this point. Uh, definitely, if you haven't played them, I would totally go play them. I, I think that, that I, I would describe them as possibly even essential games to check out right like people make those lists like games you should you should play in your life whatever right <laughs> excuse me um i would definitely put it up there uh the writing is still really strong in portal 2 um i thought it was i think the characters are charming they're funny um there's a couple dialogue and twists and lines that i kind of forgot about actually that kind of um I laughed all over again, Hat. <laughs> uh, good. This is more of an aside than anything, but it's it's good. And 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 I guess actually, because I mentioned last week that I, I wanted to play Quantum Conundrum, and the reason I started playing Portal, and and then Portal Two is that I wanted to play Quantum Conundrum. I wanted to play kind of the originals before the spiritual successor, and I'm a couple hours into the game. I haven't. I haven't finished it. I, I I don't even think I'm... I'm about three hours in. I don't think I've even gotten close to finishing it. Uh, but it's like... It makes sense as a spiritual successor of from what I've played so far. I think I've finished about a quarter of it. It's very much like going for the same thing. You're in like this weird location um, with all these random testing chambers. There's a character who's talking to you. There's kind of like a, more of a comedic twist in this than in um that's another thing about portal 2 is it's much more comedic than the first game the first game is is generally played straight with a little bit of like kind of dark sort of like sarcastic humor with how glados refers to you and and stuff like that um two has much more humor in it and i think it's fine because I, I, the humor works for me but uh yeah, that's another, that's another difference I, I, I kind of realize. Um, I realize now. Uh, um, Quantum Conundrum is is have doing that same sort of, like, humorous character kind of humorously talking to you. Not, like, with malicious intent. It's, like, your uncle who's, like, speaking to you over the, the like, the intercom and things like that. Uh... And it's, fu it's here's the problem is he, he's he's played by uh, uh, John. Oh God, what's his name? John. Oh, what's his name? He's Q from Star Trek. John Delancey, and he's playing this kind of like, uh, <laughs> like sort of like funny, mad scientist character, right? And he has a great voice, right? Everyone knows John Delancey's got a a great voice. Uh, the problem for me is that I know that John Delancey is like a huge asshole. He's like a big asshole in real life. Um, and it's like really hard 
for me to imagine the character as like anyone else it's 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 i keep i keep just hearing john delancey and i don't want to like him <laughs> cuz i know he's a big dick <sighs> okay um so like that kind of makes it hard and that's like a very exterior thing but it it does impact my enjoyment of the game um, in terms of, like, the puzzling, I like it. I, it has a good gimmick of, like, you're switching between <clears throat> these different dimensions. You have, like, one, a soft one where everything's, like, really light and you can pick up heavy objects. Well, they're, they're not heavy in that dimension. There's the heavy one where, like, things get super weighed down and you can, like, push down pressure plates and things like that that you wouldn't be able to. There's, like, some fun, <clears throat> there's, like, some fun stuff where they do, like, bounce pads where there's a lot of, like, switching. I think that I want to say Quantum Conundrum is actually a little bit more mechanically challenging than Portal is. Portal's got some stuff where it's like they want you to do stuff kind of fast, but Quantum Conundrum has a lot more uh, puzzles that involve like really quickly switching between the different dimensions and like picking stuff up and moving in these very specific ways so that you can pick things up and throw them. And it just feels like a little more requires a little more coordination than than even Portal did at some points. Um, uh, Portal would ask you to like, for instance, like, oh, shoot one portal, come out the other one, and then while you're still like in the air from that one, shoot the shoot your first portal at a new place, so you come out of there to get more momentum and things like that. Quantum Conundrum will have you do things like, oh, you have to. Um, launch so they'll they'll there's like this kind of physics thing that they establish where you can put like a safe for instance uh go into like the light dimension pick up the safe put it on this like bounce bounce plate it doesn't bounce like by itself it's basically like a spring mounted plate uh platform put it on there uh switch to the heavy dimension stand on top of the 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 safe which is now weighing down the the spring plate switch to the the light dimension so that you go it, it basically like the, the difference between mass makes it just just shoot up super fast um super far and then once you reach the and then if you can't like they kind of introduce this so it'll have you do like okay so you stand on top of it and then you basically ride the safe uh, across and then at some point what i had to do was switched then to the fluffy dimension mid-air that's the light dimension the fluffy dimension switch to the fluffy walk off the safe so i could pick it up and then toss it this is all in mid-air in the span of like a, about a second and then toss it into uh this basically shoot so that it can like power up a thing and it's like Oh, it wasn't a safe. That specific puzzle, it's like a little, little like, energy core thing. So you shoot into this, like, shoot, like a basketball. And, uh, it's like, it took me a lot of tries to actually get it down. Because, like, you can't pick up objects while you're standing on top of them. So you have to, like, take, like, a few steps in midair off the, 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 uh, the, the energy core so that you can pick it up and then toss it. And, like, it, there's a lot, it's a lot more happening than I feel like was going on in Portal. And then they'll do these things where it's like, okay, same principle of like stand on a safe on a spring plate, go from heavy to light, bounce up, but oh, it's not high enough for you to like reach the platform up above. So uh, at the apex of the safe's like jump, I guess, the, of the, 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 the safe's launch, switch back to heavy so that you go down and then once, and then like you, you go down faster with like more mass land on the spring plate, weigh it down for like a half second, then switch back to fluffy so that you preserve uh, the the kinetic energy doesn't get dispersed out. And it just gets, you, because you go back to fluffy, you get launched back up even higher. So a lot of stuff like that um, is involved. And like lots of like, I don't know, tricky platforming stuff. It, it is, it's fun. Like it's, it's engaging and it's fun to solve the puzzles. Uh, just kind of interesting, like, it's not quite as charming, I guess, as Portal was in the way that Portal is. Because um, I don't really find the uncle character quite as amusing. 
Uh, there's a couple of things that I, I did genuinely enjoy, like, uh, <laughs> or found funny. There's this little, like, uh, little green fuzzy guy called Ike. And he's sort of like the professor's little little buddy, little helper. And he appears kind of throughout the game to, like, give you stuff. And sometimes he'll just be hanging out. And um, there's, like, all these portraits. I thought all these little portraits of, like, different points in time that they time traveled back to. And they're in, like, feudal Japan. And Ike, just this little fuzzy guy, he's wearing, like, a traditional kimono. And it looks really funny to me for some reason. He's wearing, like, a tiny little baby-sized kimono. I found that really amusing. <laughs> or this, like, giant oversized conquistador helmet that's too big for his head. It's pretty funny. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, it's, 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 it is, is good. I should probably, I want to play more puzzle games. Drop some good puzzle games down below that, that I should check out. Because I've always been like, oh, I'm too dumb to figure out puzzle games. Ah, I'm not smart enough. But I played, po I was like, damn, yeah, that's probably just fucking making that up. I'm probably just, probably just psyching myself out into uh, not enjoying this kind of genre. Yeah, it's a uh, quantum conundrum. It's, it's, it's so far three hours in. It's good. Maybe, maybe it super drops off, and I'll let you guys know next week when I've probably beaten it. But um, yeah. Oh boy, I think I want to draw that to a close. Draw, draw, draw. Start drawing it to a close right about now. So uh, hey, if you've been listening, if you've been listening this long, thank you for listening to me ramble. Uh, if you have a question, please leave it down in the comments below. But please leave it in the form of a question because I don't just want to read your thoughts out loud. Uh, I really want to get a video out before the end of the month. Um, I think it'll either be the end of the month or like the first day or two of next month, which I don't like, but it, it might be how it is. So, um, yeah, sorry about that. If you've been anticipating a video this month. Um, I am working on it again every day and I like the way that it's coming out, but, uh, yeah, uh, the main channel, uh, the Patreon, all that stuff. Bye.